you sound very, very sleepy. <laughs> uh, I want to take just a moment this morning like I do every week. And if you're a first time guest here this morning or maybe you've just not been here in a while, we want to tell you that we are thankful that you're here, glad you're here this morning. And we hope that you feel welcome and love this morning. And um, today we are in week number four of the series we've been calling The Chain Breaker. The Chain Breaker. And uh, in the Chain Breaker series, we've been talking about freedom. And I hope this, this morning you've seen some progress in your life. I hope this morning that you have seen some chains fall away. But um, I believe today uh, may be the most powerful week in this series and uh, if you've missed any of the last three you can uh, go online and you can see those on YouTube or on Facebook and uh, catch up to kind of where we are this morning and uh, you know I, what I want for you what I want for all of you is that you can live a life of freedom every day not being bound by anything not not being held down by anything. And uh, I believe that today we can finally find that place of freedom. And so if you have your Bible or if you have a mobile device with a Bible on it, you can turn over to John 3. And uh, if you don't have a Bible this morning, like if you don't own one, there's a gold Bible in the back of your seat. And uh, I just want to let you know that you're welcome to that. There's Gideons in our church that provide those, and so this morning that is our gift to you. And so we're going to read John 14 in just a minute, and uh, I said 14, not 16. So uh, before we get into that, I want to pray, and then we'll give a little context, and then we'll get into the message. And so right now, let's pray, God, we, uh, we come to you, and we want to invite you into this message, God. We want you to we want you to to take control in this moment, God. We want to see you uh, move in our lives, God. We want to experience the freedom that Christ has died to give us. God, uh, give us wisdom in this moment and, and God, you just hide me behind your cross right now. Lord, we love you and thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. And so this morning we're in John 3, and we're all familiar with John 3, right? We all heard of John 3, but normally we hear of John 3, 16, right? Does anybody know that verse? Ever heard of that? Man, you all are asleep. And if you don't know what John 3, 16 is, that's for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And I learned that just for you guys this morning. That, that's why I'm the preacher. That's, because, that's the test. And so, uh, we're not talking about John 3.16 this morning. We're talking about John 3.14. And so, I want to give you the context behind it. And uh, the book of John is written by one of Jesus' best friends. Uh, he did life with Jesus for three and a half years. His name was John. And uh, where we pick up in John's account of what Jesus done is uh, Jesus has just begun his public ministry, but he's kind of started with a bang. And uh, he's done some miracles. He's done some amazing things. And there's some people who believe that he might just be the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. And... Uh, in the Jewish way of thinking, the Messiah was going to come in power and in might, and he was going to destroy the Roman Empire. Of course, we know that wasn't what Jesus came to do, but the Jews believed that the Messiah would be a man of power. And so the religious leaders, when people began saying that Jesus might just be the Messiah, the religious leaders took notice of this young man who had started a ministry from Galilee. And uh, he was a different kind of teacher. He was healing people. He was preaching a different kind of message. And he was treating people differently than all the other teachers. And uh, 
this caught the eye of this man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was, was one of those religious leaders. He was a Pharisee, and they were one of the ruling groups of people in Israel at this time. And so Nicodemus was a ruling Pharisee. He had power and he had influence. And he just happened to believe that Jesus might be from God. And so the religious leaders of the day, they didn't approve of Jesus. They hadn't put their seal of approval on him yet. And so if you were caught talking to Jesus, you were considered a follower of Jesus. And that is not what Nicodemus wanted. And so Nicodemus, he meets Jesus in the middle of the night. And that was inconvenient for Jesus, but uh, Jesus will often meet with people even if it's inconvenient for him. And so Jesus meets this man, Nicodemus, in the middle of the night. And uh, he, uh, Nicodemus comes up to him and he says, Jesus, I believe that you might just be from God. And we're not sure if he actually believed at this point or not, but we do believe that he was trying to flatter him. He was trying to get on Jesus' good side because he believed Jesus would have power and influence and he wanted in. And so Nicodemus is trying to flatter Jesus, but Jesus sees Nicodemus' heart and cuts right to the issue. He says that, No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. He addresses Nicodemus' spiritual issue. And then he continues the conversation for a few verses. And then in verse 14, he says this really weird phrase. And uh, we're going to read it. He says, uh, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. And for us, we may have never caught this verse. We may have never recognized this verse, because when we get to John 3, we're always headed towards verse 16, and we might just miss 14 and 15. (coughs) We don't know this story. As modern Christians, we're unfamiliar with the story that Jesus is referencing. It's actually found in Numbers 21, and uh, we don't know it, but Nicodemus would have been well aware of what Jesus was talking about when he said Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And so what I want to do is give you The story, you don't have to turn to Numbers 21, but I do want to give you that story so you know what we're talking about today. Um, In Numbers 21, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, have just come out of 400 years of slavery to Egypt. And um, they really don't know how to live as anything but slaves. Moses has miraculously led them out of the nation of, of Egypt. And he has promised to take them to this promised land, this place of prosperity. And um, the only way to get to the promised land is through the desert. And that's often true about us, that between where we are and where we're going, there might just be a desert. And these people go out into the desert, and uh, there's no food in the desert, in case you hadn't heard nor is there water, but God has provided these people with a meal and water every single day. We know it is manna, which means, what in the world is it? They didn't even know what this food they were eating was, but they had it every single day. And in Numbers 21, they say to Moses, Moses, you've led us out here where there is no food and there is no water. What were you thinking? And they began to complain to Moses. They began to complain about what God was providing for them. They had their eyes on what they didn't have instead of what they did. And that's what the tactic of the enemy is, that he'll get you so focused on what you don't have that you can't appreciate the things that you do have. And so 
That's what he's doing to the, to the Israelites. And they begin to complain and they get, begin to mutter against God. And So God sends a bunch of poisonous snakes into the camp. That's terrible. <laughs> That's terrible. I, I, I couldn't imagine... I'm not a snake guy, like if they have the snakes in the exhibit, I'm not not holding the snakes. <laughs> I'm not holding, neither is Nick. Nick's not holding the snakes either. And so, I'm not a snake guy, and I can't imagine there being snakes everywhere. Like, everywhere. Not just snakes, but poisonous snakes. They could be green snakes and I would be done. But these were poisonous snakes, and they were biting everybody. We don't know what kind of snake they were. We just know that these people were dying from these snake bites. And it was a slow and agonizing death. And so I don't know how long it took the Israelites to repent about complaining, but I know that it wouldn't have took me long. I would have been done in about 30 seconds. God, I'm done with complaining. But we really don't know how long these Israelites dealt with this before they repented. But I can just imagine that it, they, these snakes were the talk of the town. Like, how could you talk about anything else? If there's snakes crawling everywhere, you're going to be talking about them. And uh, so people were talking about the snakes, and they were talking about... Um, the snake bites and how bad they hurt. And did you hear about uh, Sue down the road? She got bit. And oh no, Sue. And everybody was talking about how bad the snakes were. And everybody was talking about how bad the snake bites hurt. And, and uh, there was one guy probably down there at the corner. Uh, and, and he was selling stuff. And he said, if you drink this, then you might just get healed. And, you know, people take uh, advantage of anything. They was probably selling uh, snake bite self-help books, if I was going to guess. And they was just trying to do anything to deal with the snake situation. And so they were trying to figure out how to cure the snake bites and they were trying to figure out how to deal with the snake bites and they were uh, probably bought little uh, canisters of snake away to spray in your tent that way the snakes don't come in. They were probably doing all kinds of things to deal with these snakes. And uh, so they finally decide they're done with the snakes. Finally. I don't know how long it was. It may have been an hour. Or it may have been two weeks. I don't know. But they say, Moses, we're done with the snakes. Will you please pray that God takes the snakes away? I bet they did. I bet they did say that. And so they, they pray. Moses prays for God to take the snakes away. And God says, all right, here's what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to go and I want you to make a fake snake out of bronze. And I want you to put it on a pole and I want you to put it up in the middle of the camp. So if I was Moses, I was thinking, all right, maybe, maybe if the snakes see the snake on the pole, they'll all leave. But that wasn't what God was doing. God says... Put this bronze snake up in the middle of the camp. Put it up on the pole. And if anybody, when they get snake bit, if anybody looks at that bronze snake, if they'll just look at it, they'll live. They'll live. This wasn't what they prayed for. Let me make that clear. They prayed that the snakes would go away. They wanted the snakes to go away, but that wasn't what God gave them. God gave them a way to overcome the thing that was killing them. They asked for the snakes to be taken away, but as far as we know, the snakes never were. The snakes may have never, they may have traveled with those snakes for the rest of their time in the desert. But 
what God gave them was a way to overcome the thing that was trying to kill them. And so today, many of us have snakes in the camp. We've got things that's going on in our life and the pain, the hurt, the snake bite is excruciating. And you've tried to get rid of the snakes. You've tried to buy a self-help book about the snakes. You've tried getting snake away. You've tried everything in the book to get rid of your snakes and to, and to do something about that snake bite that's killing you, but you just can't seem to do anything about it. You might have a sin snake, a lust snake, a fear snake. You might have a shame snake, a regret snake, or maybe even an addiction snake. But whatever... Your snake is today, chances are it's all you can focus on. It's all you can get your mind on. <coughs> you tried every home remedy to deal with your snake. You've tried harder to overcome your snake bite, but you just can't seem to overcome it. You've tried avoiding the snakes. You've tried uh, dressing the wounds so that you... Uh, could just fix it on your own. You've tried everything to do to deal with your snake bite, but nothing seems to be working. And chances are your life may have looked uh, like you've tried to overcome the snake and you failed. And then you try a little harder, and then you fail. And then you try a little harder, and then you fail. And then you try a little harder, and then you fail. Has anybody been there? Or am I talking to myself this morning? You tried to go on the diet, but you failed. You tried to quit that thing, but you failed. You tried to beat that addiction, but you failed. You tried and you failed. Has any of you ever been there? You've tried and you failed and you found out that you have some chains. You have some things in your life and you want to quit. You want to stop. You want to get rid of the snakes and the snake bites. But you can't seem to do it and you've prayed about it. You've prayed for the snakes to be gone, right? God, if you'll just, if you'll just take this, then I'll live the rest of my life for you. If you'll just do this one thing for me, God, I, I'll, I'll do better tomorrow. I'll try harder tomorrow. I'll do more and be better tomorrow. And it's not worked. Sure, it worked maybe that one time for a week, or maybe that time for six weeks, or maybe six months, or maybe a year, but at the end of the day, you realize that those chains that you became so familiar with, they're still there. So what do you do? What do you do when you, your snakes are more than you can deal with? What do you do with that? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, He who knew no sin became sin. And died on a cross so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became the thing that you're dealing with and died up on a pole so that if you could just look and see the thing you've been dealing with crucified on the cross and believe you could be healed. You must not be dealing with anything. Did you hear what I said? I said, your snake, whatever your snake is, whatever you are dealing with this morning, 
The way you overcome it is not by trying harder or doing better. It's by looking to see that that thing died on the cross. That thing that you're dealing with, that thing that you can't seem to overcome, the way you overcome is by looking at the cross. It's by looking to see that whatever you're dealing with up on that tree, up on that hill, died. And if it died, it no longer has power over you. You're dealing with a dead snake this morning. It's easy to scare somebody with a dead snake. But this morning, you are dealing with a dead snake. Dead snakes can't hurt you. Dead snakes have no power over you. And whatever you are dealing with, it was taken up on that cross and died. The thing that was killing you, the thing you could not overcome, died on that cross. Whatever chain that is holding you down, whatever issue that you were dealing with, It died on the cross. You can look to the cross this morning, whatever you're dealing with, whatever you've got going on, and you can see your thing hanging there. Did you know this morning that fear, maybe you're held down by fear, fear died on the cross. Maybe you're dealing with lust. This morning, lust died on the cross. Pornography died on the cross, guys. Food addiction, that died on the cross. Shame, that died on the cross. Regret, that died on the cross. Addiction, depression. Whatever it is that you're dealing with this morning, it died on the cross. And now all you have to do to overcome that thing is look up and see Jesus hanging there on that cross and realize that sin died. That thing that was holding you, that thing you fought with your whole life, that thing that you can't seem to get over, Jesus already overcome it. Jesus already dealt with it. Instead of trying to fix it on your own, instead of trying to pull your life together on your own, instead of trying to do it all by yourself, just look up and see that snake hanging on the pole and you will have life. You will have freedom. When you look up and see that thing defeated that you've been dealing with, you can live a life in freedom. The snakes may still be there. And they may still bite. But listen up. They have no power over you. Amen. Listen to me. They may still crawl around. They may still show up late at night. And they may still try to bite. But when they do, you just remind them, you already died. That part of me already died. That thing that's holding me, it already died. And so I don't have to struggle against it anymore. I just have to remind myself that that thing died. Jesus overcome. In John 14 he says, In this world you will have problems. That sounds like a promise. You will have snakes in this world. If he had left it at that, it would have been a disappointing statement. But he said, In this world you will have problems. You will have snakes. But take heart. Because I... Everybody say, I. I I overcome the world. 
You didn't overcome it. Cody, Cody didn't overcome the world. Cody's been failing at trying to overcome the things in my life for as long as I've lived. And so have you. He didn't say you will overcome the world. He said, take heart because I have already overtaken the world. You can overcome this morning because Jesus did. Jesus overcame, you overcame. Jesus won, you win. It's not because of anything you've done. You can't stop sinning by trying to quit sinning. Amen. Can you? You tried it. You tried to be nicer, didn't you? And you couldn't. You tried to quit that thing. You tried to love people more, but you just couldn't do it on your own. And so what we have to realize is that our freedom has nothing to do with us. All we have to do to be free is look up and believe on Jesus. Look up and believe on Jesus. Believe that He broke your chains. Believe that He set you free. And now you can live in freedom. Jesus would say, He who the Son has set free is going back to bondage. No. He who the Son set free will still have to, will still have to try to do, get freedom on their own. He who the Son set free will try and try and try, and if he tries hard enough, he might just get it. No, he who the Son has set free is free indeed. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. Stop looking at you, stop looking at your failures. And get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on the victory that He won for you at the cross. Sin is dead. Sin is defeated. The thing you're dealing with this morning is defeated. Sin has no power over you. Jesus won. You are free. You are free. So the band's about to come up, but I want us to learn a statement while they're coming to get ready to play for altar call. And when this temptation comes this week, when the thing you, you always deal with comes back up, because it will, you will face temptations, you will run into your snake. Here's what I want you to do. Three simple sentences. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. And I am free. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. And I am free. And so when the devil comes and, and he, he, he says, Well, you're not really free. He said you were, but you, you're not really. You don't believe enough. You don't have enough faith to be free. You don't deserve freedom. You're not worthy of freedom. When he comes and tells you this week, this is what I want you to say. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. And I am free. Let's say it together. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. And I am free. Let's say it together. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. I'm free. Again, sin is dead. Jesus is alive. And I'm free. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you got an attitude at the devil. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. I'm free. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. I'm free. Say it on your feet. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. I'm free. Sin is dead. Jesus is alive. I'm free. Now you can worship like you're free, church.